Testing, testing, is this thing on? Okay, are we ready to do this? All right, so this is an intro talk to Elixir. How many people have used Elixir before? Good. How many people have heard of Elixir before? How many people were looking for the, you know, coffee shop and they thought it was back here and just kind of stumbled in? Oh, okay. All right, so I am Johnny Wynn, most, uh, most commonly known as Johnny Rugger. It gets confusing to people. They think my last name is Rugger, but it's not. Uh, that comes from playing rugby. Uh, I did it for a number of years until I retired. Well, rugby and retirement, if you've ever played rugby, basically means my wife told me to stop playing. Um, so every once in a while, I go out there and I run around, and <coughs> let's just say I'm getting a little old. Um, so I host a podcast it's called Elixir Fountain. Have anybody heard of it? Listen to it? Enjoy it? Love it? Okay, one. Nice. Okay. Well, I would say everybody go out there and check it out. It's on SoundCloud. You can also get it on whatever favorite app you have for podcasts. It's available. Uh, there's an RSS feed. Uh, currently, I work at Imbala Power Networks. Uh, I really enjoy what I do. We're actually building virtual power plants to manage renewable resources. Uh, it's a very complex thing to handle. There's a lot of ins and outs, and uh, actually, I'll probably talk quite a bit more about that tomorrow if you come to the talk on Coyote. Uh, basically, these systems are large. Uh, you know, they're distributed systems that have to calculate cost and try to find the most effective way to use these resources to handle grid problems. Now, as far as Elixir goes, I've been using Elixir for just over four years now. Yes, I'm one of the few people that started way a long time ago. I, I know last year, I believe it was at NDC Oslo, the My Elixir status hashtag was like the second top hashtag or something like that from people coming from here or something. I remember seeing a post on it. I actually started that several years ago as a way to help kind of bring everybody together because not only is Elixir a, a great language for doing distributed uh, uh, programming, but it's also was a very distributed network. Like everybody was scattered around. We were all kind of like all over the place. It kind of sometimes felt like there was five of us all chatting. <coughs> and the Elixir Fountain started as a newsletter to try to drum up kind of interest in Elixir. And so it was really hard to find articles. Uh, back in that day, if you Googled Elixir, chances are you were going to either find uh, root Elixir strings. If anybody plays guitar, there's Elixir strings. Um, that came up all the time. There's also... And, of course, if you Google Ruby Elixir, there's a club in Tampa, Florida called Ruby's Elixir. That came up all the time. So needless to say, I spent hours trying to find articles and searching for the few things that were out there. And so what I did is I came up with the hashtag MyElixirStatus. If you're doing something in Elixir or if you want to find help with something, you can tweet something with MyElixirStatus and people will follow it. Uh, I tend to retweet those quite a bit from the Elixir Fountain Twitter account. So if you're out there, if you're learning Elixir, uh, that's a great place to start. You can find tons of articles and things like that. There's also several newsletters out there, including one from Plataforma Tech, uh, Elixir Radar, and there's Elixir Weekly. Uh, th these are all great sources for learning. Now, before we get too far into this, I have a little disclaimer. I'm not a big fan of intro to language X talks, um, mainly because they're kind of very specific. And I came up with this idea for this talk called What to Expect When You're Elixiring based on the idea that how many people have kids? How many people have one kid? Two, three, four, five, six, seven. I've been there once or twice. <laughs> but one thing that I noticed, oh, sorry. My feed stopped there for a second, okay. Um, one thing I noticed, it's, there is kind of a bit of a parallel between when you're going to uh, you know, have a kid and when you're learning a new language. Uh, by no means are you creating life, but you're learning something new. And everything else out there is very generic. It's like, well, you know, if you know, trimester one, expect this. Trimester two, expect that. Oh, they don't bother to tell you that once they turn 18, it's a whole nother ball game. By the way, I have two 20-year-olds. Um, so, you know, it's like everything is so generalized that it, you don't really get much out of it. Like, maybe you kind of spark a little interest. Maybe you kind of pick up something here or there. <coughs> but now, there's a funny story I've got for this is that, so my daughter, who's 10 now, 
So this is 10 years ago. You know, of course, my wife has read several of the books and all that kind of stuff, and I've read a few of them myself. When she was born, we decided to do a home birth. How many people have had a home birth? On purpose, not on accident. Um, so as we're going through this whole thing, and I feel at this point now I have several children that I kind of know my responsibilities, I know what I'm supposed to do. Well, then my wife decides we're going to do a home birth, and so that's a whole other ballgame. We're going to a midwife, we have a doula, and all sorts of things like that. But I'm still feeling pretty confident in what I know. The day my daughter was born. So that evening, the night before, my wife was starting to not feel so good. But she wasn't sure what was it. She's like, maybe I just need to sleep, maybe I need to rest, whatever. So that's fine. She wakes me up at 7 o'clock in the morning. And she's like, I've been up all night, and I think I've been having contractions, and they haven't been you know, going so well, I think they're pretty close. I said, well, how close are they? She's like, well, about, you know, every 10 minutes or so or something like that. And I was like, well, how long has that been going on? Uh, the past couple of hours. Did you call the midwife? No, I didn't want to bug her. It's the middle of the night. <laughs> so I was like, let's call the midwife. So we called the midwife. This is my wife on the phone. Uh-huh. Oh, okay. Uh, all right. Oh, yeah, I'll let you talk to him. She hands me the phone, and the wife gets on the phone. She is having that baby any second now. You better get ready, because you're going to be getting that baby. I'm trying to get there as fast as I can, but I don't know if I'm going to be able to get there in time. All of a sudden, all that introductory knowledge that I had went out the door. Now I am getting ready to birth a baby, which I have never done before. And actually, I didn't end up having to do it that time either. Luckily, the midwife showed up at the door. But in any case, so that brings me to when I came to sit down and write this talk. Now, the conference uh, organizers are going to love me because I don't actually have any slides. I wrote the entire talk using Elixir. Basically, I have one application that runs in the background on one node, and I have another application that runs in the foreground on another node. It's actually what's going to be displaying things and talking to you. The one in the background is actually going to be doing all the work, and we're going to do some kind of cool things because, honestly, I can show you, and I will, some of the basics, we'll cover the basics, just so everybody gets an idea. But I want to show you some of the cooler features, the, some of the features that I enjoy. And really, I'll kind of go into more depth on them tomorrow if you come to the talk. But this is actually kind of a good little quick view of them. So let's tell Victoria that it's time. There. What is Elixir? So essentially, Elixir is a dynamic functional language. By the way, most of these like basic slides I stole from the uh, Getting Started site. Go to the Getting Started site. It's a great site, great material. It's easy to follow. It's easy to get through. <coughs> but it's basically, it's a dynamic uh, functional language built on the Erlang virtual machine. You get to take advantage of all the power that Erlang has without necessarily having to write Erlang. How many people have had to write Erlang? How many people enjoy writing Erlang? I do too. We're like the few out there. Most people are like, oh, I can't stand the syntax. But it's, like, it's not that bad. I don't mind it. Um, and I'm, you know, I kind of side with the uh, Joe Armstrong idea where it's, it's syntax really doesn't matter. If you enjoy it, you enjoy it. If not, you know, it's not that big of a deal. So, but like I said, Elixir is great for scalability, fault tolerance, which we're going to see some of that stuff. Uh, really cool features that the language has built into it because it was written on Beam. Now. Basic types and curiosities. I love that voice because it's like just so monotone because I'm like, yeah, basic types. Hey, guess what, guys? Elixir has types like every other language out there. Um, so, yeah, so we have integers, of course. We have binaries. Uh, now, one kind of little thing to note is that everything, you can actually compare one type to another type. If, if you see on there, everything has its place. So numbers being the smallest, we go all the way up to bit strings. But you can actually compare one value against another, even though they're different types, and see which one's greater. Now, atoms is one of those tricky bits that we want to talk about because they are not garbage collected. Now, if anybody's used other languages that have symbols, things like that, the name is actually the value of the, uh, of the atom. 
And those aren't garbage collected. Those are written in local history, and so it stays there. They never go away. This is one of the things that you want to keep in mind because you only have 1,048,576 of those. Now, you can configure that. And, of course, that includes all the atoms that the system already has. So you don't want to let users generate atoms because you can do that. Now, one of the things that you can do when you're trying to protect yourself from things like that, if you'll notice in my example code, is we have the atom atom, and we can say to existing atom, which means it's going to reuse the atom that's there. If we tried to use the to existing atom and create an atom based on a uh, binary that doesn't exist, it's actually going to throw us an error and say, no, that doesn't there, you know, it's not there. Now, because you can do string to atom, but that goes back to that you're generating atoms, and if you're doing that dynamically, Based on user input, somebody could pound your system. Now, of course, you're going to run out of the number of atoms before you run out of the number of much memory. But if you're in there tweaking your configuration to where you're bumping that up, you could run into problems. Lists. Lists are another thing. How many people have done functional programming before? Nice. OK, so you're familiar with lists. We won't cover it too much. This is basically what a list is. It's a list of lists. Uh, going all the way down, but you can do things like grab the head. You can do pattern matching on that to grab the first element in a list. It's really easy to get through. Um, let's see here. Anonymous functions. Ah, now we're getting to the good stuff. Anonymous functions. So now functions in uh, functions in Elixir and in Erlang are identified by the name and the arity. So there's, there's a couple of cool things that we can do with this. Now, yes, we can create anonymous functions. You can actually pass them around. You can set them to, uh, uh, you can match them to variables or bind them to variables and then pass those in as arguments uh, to be executed later. Um, but one of the cool things, that, and there's also a syntax on, I don't know if you're familiar with it, if you, if you do know Elixir, uh, is the, the shorthand for uh, anonymous functions where you just use the ampersand and you actually give the number argument that you're passing in. So if the first, if you're passing in one, an arity of one, you can do ampersand one, and that'll give you that value. <coughs> and then, of course, you can execute it by calling dot parens passing in a param. Um, as far as the actual arity goes, we can do, one of the things that we can do is, is as we're actually looping over, we can pass in an ampersand the name slash the arity and that actually passes that function in, so you can pass, like if you're mapping over something, you can actually iterate over it and it'll call that function for you over and over again. Um, I, that's pretty common, it's in Erlang, and uh, we use it a lot, and you'll probably see it some in some of this code. Grouping code and modules. Now, modules. This is one of the things about functions that's, that's kind of odd is that, uh, you know, anonymous function you can use anywhere. If you open up IEX, you can create an anonymous function, execute it, no problem. A named function, on the other hand, has to be grouped in modules. Now, one of the first things, if you come from an object-oriented language, object-oriented background or object-oriented language, you see modules, you think class. It's not a class. It's just a grouping of similar functions with similar functionality <coughs> or purpose. Now, we can create one. Here's a simple one where we just create a math. Uh, one of the things that we're doing in this, in this module that we've created is we have two functions, uh, zero, uh, question mark, where one we've actually set zero. And so if it's zero, if the value is zero, it's going to be true because we're asking if it's zero. If it's anything else and that's an integer, it's going to be false. So we're doing some pattern matching there on our actual arity to say, if a zero gets passed in, we know always what it is. So we can kind of get around using some conditionals like if. Although ifs are there, they do use them. I try to not. Um, but now, let's take a break. Everybody ready? Come on, y'all. Let's go. You guys look so, come on. This is a fun conference, right? Everybody's having a good time, right? Yes, we're having a good time. So, so I gave a talk in Sweden last week, and it's funny it was because it was the same thing. Everybody just kind of, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And you got to get, come on, interactive. And feel free to ask questions, too. I don't mind. I actually had this whole thing timed to where Victoria would actually push me to keep going through because of, I don't know if you noticed this, but I tend to talk a lot. Um, so I had her kind of going through. I was like, this is never going to work because I'm going to be off time all the time. And I'm going to be constantly having her go back and stuff like that. So... Let's take a little bit of a break, and we're going to actually look at some code, because we're going to need this later. 
Everybody can see this all right, right? The beloved Fibonacci scale. So what we're going to actually do is I have this class or this module called Sequencer, and we're going to actually determine uh, a sequence of Fibonacci numbers based on the link that we pass in. Now, I also want to introduce you to XUnit, which XUnit is basically the testing framework. Uh, so we can actually write our tests. We can execute our tests. And, of course, I've got them all commented out. Because as you notice, if there's one fun thing about our Fibonacci function right now, guess what? It always passes because we've hard-coded values. Come on, interactive, yeah. Um, so we kind of want to get this to pass. But before I do that, I want to make a note of something on line three, the doc test. One of the things that we do is we actually have doc tests. So if you'll notice in the actual sequencer, there's on line nine, we're actually executing the code. Well, the doc test will actually execute that code. So if at any point in time, the code changes and that is not true, we will actually get an error. So we know that our documentation needs to be updated and or we broke something in the code. It's kind of handy. That makes sure your docs are always right. Because everybody loves writing docs, right? Yes. No. Um, so let's run this real quick just so that everybody knows that I am running it. We run it with Mix Test. Now, Mix is a, a toolkit that basically does a lot of the stuff. When we create projects, uh, we run our code. We have mixed tasks that actually can be written. You can do custom tasks. When you're actually trying to do some things, um, there's a lot of custom tasks when you look at libraries like Ecto and things like that where they're actually doing like your migrations or you're you know, running other processes that you want that kind of run outside the scope of your application. Mix Test is one that you will use often. Hey, look, our test passed. Let's ship it, right? Oh, let's do this. We'll add one more test. Now, so we're just going to basically assert that we have what we think we should have when we pass a uh, length of six. So that means we want six numbers. Oh, did I say that? Uh, so it's funny, and uh, I don't know how many of you are Emacs or Space Max users. It doesn't either way. But yes, everything on the screen is big, but if you look at the very bottom, that's what I'm trying to link in. The very bottom is actually where it tells me whether or not I actually wrote the file. Um, so anyway, so no, I did not write it that time. This, oh, see, it's broken. Well, I'll begin to call it two in the morning. So let's go fix this. Now, one of the things that we did with this, or I did with this function was I actually underscored in front of the parameter, meaning that I don't really care about this value. If, on one hand, I took this out, and try to run this, I would actually get a thing saying unused parameter, hey, you did something wrong. Uh, so if you ha are passing in parameters and you don't care about them, you want to ignore them, you just underscore them, and then it tends to, uh, uh, and then it doesn't worry about them at all. Now this is also true in pattern matching. So say you're trying to get the head and you don't really care about the end of the list, you can just do head, pipe symbol, underscore, and then it'll match and then it'll put the head in head and everything else will just be ignored. <clears throat> so, now let's see here. Now, we need to actually uh, calculate. We want to pass our length. And we're going to start this by giving it an empty list to fill. So, when we do this now, let's run it just to make sure. We should have a passing test. And actually, because I'm so handy for y'all there, we can get them all passing. Yay. Let's kind of evaluate this a little bit. So we have a module that we've now added our primary function, which is the Fibonacci, where we pass in a length. That's going to be actually our public API for this module. It's going to let us, everything else is private. We have two types of name functions. We have uh, def, def2 and def p2. Remember I said name and arity. Uh, so our private functions can't be called from, from outside this module or outside the context of this module, but our public ones can be. So in our case, what we actually did is we call the function calculate with passing a length with an empty string. The first time it's there, we know what it's going to be. It's going to be zero. So we put this zero in. Uh, and then we actually kind of have an accumulator that's kind of building that list for us. 
Uh, remember I said that you can underscore if we don't care about the end of the list? Well, see, in our pattern matching on line 23, what I did was I wanted the first two values, and then I don't care about anything else. So I can set those to A and B, and I can kind of move forward from there, and then I can you know, add them on and, and add them to the list. And then we just iterate over it, and, of course, at the end, our list is reversed, so we need to go ahead and reverse it so that we have the list looking the way we want it to look. Never mind what's on 29. We'll get to that later. Everything else you can pay attention to. So that is a trip through some modules and a look at some testing. What's next? Graduating to processes. Processes, what everybody loves, right? <coughs> so one of the things that you have to get used to really quick in Elixir is dealing with supervision trees and gen servers and, or, and supervisors. This entire application is dependent on understanding how those work. Now, we can create a basic gen server, and in fact, our, our mailbox for our session app, the, the session app that's in the front, all it is is a gen server that's, oh, see, she gets impatient, and she just moves on to the next thing. Um, so the way we do that is we use gen server, and then we actually have a start link, which we can con or connect using the uh, supervisor, which we'll see in a second. And then we call genserver.startlink. We give it the module that it's in. Uh, we can pass in anything that we want at startup. And then we can use either a name, and in this case, we're using the module, which it, the name can be any atom. And actually, I have them listed out. It can be an atom, which module names are atoms. Uh, it can be the global term if you want to do like a register globally. You can also use the via, uh, via tuple, which the via tuple is actually really convenient. And if you use gproc, which allows you to global re globally register uh, um, processes, you can actually use the name. gproc is built on ETS, which is the short-term in-memory storage. And it'll actually record the name of it matched up with the uh, PID. So if the PID dies, if your process dies and it has to restart, it still it still uses the name. You can get the you can still get the process a new process, whichever one it goes through. Those are a little bit out of scope of the beginner track. We'll get to those maybe in another advanced one. Um, callbacks. Now, there's actually six callbacks that are important that you actually have to implement. But when you use gen server, the nice thing is, is those are already kind of taken care of for you. You don't have to worry about it. The main ones to focus on are the handle call, handle cast, and handle info. Uh, the, I use these all the time. You kind of have to. Uh, handle call is actually when you want to do your synchronous calls. So if you're actually wanting data back. If you don't care about it, you just want to push something to a process and let it deal with it, you can use cast. If you want to send a generic message to it, uh, you can use handle info. Now, that being said, you can send any message you want to a process. If the process doesn't know how to handle it, you're going to get an error that it's got a message that it doesn't know how to deal with. So what you end up having to do is you end up doing a catch-all to say, hey, if I get this and I don't know what to do with it, um, just ignore it or move on. Or if you want to say, hey, you shouldn't have been sending me that. Why did you send that? Uh, you can do that as well. Um, this is actually really handy when uh, using something like GenEvent, because GenEvent is basically a gen server. You can implement uh, events on your own in gen, or in gen server. <coughs> but the idea is you're going to be passing messages, and you want to make sure that you deal with, if you pass a message that you don't know how to deal with, you want to know what to do. Now, that might be just ignoring it altogether, which I do a lot of times, uh, because if you don't know what to do with it, why bother? Um, you don't necessarily know where to send it. So... Our supervisors. Now, of course, as you would imagine, a supervisor is pretty critical for a supervision tree. But you actually add gen servers, and you can add events and things like that, too, uh, as workers to your supervisors to kind of build out a supervision tree. And in our case, one of the things that we're going to see a little bit of is we have a supervisor that not only monitors processes, but it also monitors other super, another supervisor, which monitors other processes. So you tend to get this tree structure built out. Uh, one of the things that I'll show you is a handy tool that's provided by the Beam called Observer. So you can actually see all your processes and see which ones are there. It comes in real handy when you get those stray processes that aren't dying and you don't know why, and you see that they're all there, and you're like, oh, maybe I did something wrong. I forgot to kill a process. Um, so 
But here's a quick look, because what we're going to look at today, there's another way to do supervisors. You can actually do a supervisor spec. If you create a new project with a supervisor, it'll be an application, and you'll see supervisor.spec. That's a different way. But what we're going to be most or looking at most today is going to be the module version, uh, where we actually use supervisor. We have a start link. <coughs> it basically follows the same patterns as Gen Server, where you have a name, you can name it the module, or you can name it the Atom, same thing. Uh, you provide the children, which in our case, we have this background calculator for our sequencer. I told you it's going to get good, trust me. Um, now, one thing to note on here is the restart for this. So you have different types of restarts when you're, when you're supervising these workers. You can do permanent, which means if the process dies, always restarts. Uh, you can do temporary, or in our case, you can do transient. What transient means is that we don't necessarily want to start a process. We only want to start a process when we're actually trying to calculate something. So we're going to actually tell it to calculate. It's going to spin up a new process that will handle the calculation. And then when it's done, it'll die, and it'll go away and drop out of the tree. Uh, why is that handy? Well, when you think about the cases where you have these long-running calculations, that you don't necessarily want to bottleneck the app. You can spin up a process, send it somewhere, and start letting it do its work. And then when the next request comes in, you spin up another one and uh, have it execute a different calculation, uh, maybe with different parameters. So. Message passing in state. Ah, state. So I want to quote Joe Armstrong here and say that Erlang is the only true object-oriented language <laughs> because it's all about message passing. So these processes actually manage their own state. Uh, you'll see when you use, when you create a gen server that it always, every, every one of your uh, callbacks for like your handle call, handle cast, everything, they always have state as the last, uh, last argument. Sorry, she, she gets so impatient. She just tries to rush me through this. Um, it's actually good because it keeps me on track a little bit. Um, so in our case right here, we're going to have the, uh, our, our gen server itself, when it starts up, we're going to initiate it with some state. We know that our first step is going to be the intro. Uh, you guys already had that. We've already had uh, the first examples. Um, and we're going to pause it there so that it doesn't t continue running through the script. Um, and then, of course, we have our handle info because these messages are actually being sent in uh, from, um, from the session or the session on a different node to say, hey, go do this thing, and then it'll kind of run through it. Um, if you notice, we have our send doc. At the end of our callback, we have to do no reply because, like I said, info is just an inbound message. So we have to tell it you're not replying to anything and you're passing back the state. Now, in the case we do a call, we would actually have a reply, what we want to give back, and then the state. In a cast, we also do the no reply and then passing state. Now, in our case, we want to use our, our state is actually a map, which it tells us what the current step is and the next step uh, is and whether or not it's paused. So we want to update that state at the end of this handle info to say, hey, we have a new state. Processes are the only one that, uh, that can actually um, update their state. You cannot update the state of a process from outside. You have to call into it to make changes to it. So in some weird way, it's kind of like a class, <laughs> but it's not. It's not. Uh, but it is kind of funny that, like, you know, it, it's all about state when it comes to processes. Now, there's three ways to call into it, or three ways to, to send a message to a process that we want to look at. Uh, one of them being send, which sends a message to a process. That's the one that's going to hit your handle info. Uh, the send after will also hit your handle info. But it allows you to send it at a later time. So say uh, you know, you're executing something, and you know at some point you're going to want to send a message to a different process or back to yourself. Uh, you can give it a time frame. So some, some of these, like if you're doing a timer, every five seconds or so you want to send a message, you can actually give it the five-second um, uh, five time frame, and then it'll send it at that time frame. Now, the other thing is, is to directly call genserver.call, genserver.cast, uh, and pass in the correct arity, and then they'll receive those messages, but you have to have your callbacks for those. Now, let's look at... I told you we're going to do something kind of cool with this sequencer. So, let's look at that here. Um, 
Okay. We good on that? That's good. Okay. So, our background calculator, because keep in mind, you know, doing a sequence of 10 numbers in Fibonacci doesn't take that long. Doing 100,000 can take a little while. Um, so, if we wanted to do that multiple times or several times over, we don't necessarily... Um, want the same machine doing it. Maybe we want to kind of distribute that. Uh, so one of the things that we're going to do here today is we're going to actually create this gen server. Now, <coughs> the first thing that I want to talk about with this gen server is everything that we mentioned. Uh, it's a gen server we do call start link. Uh, it's the module. And then we're going to actually pass in the code. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, but we're actually setting the initial state of this as being code which is going to be kind of cool. We'll get to it in a second. And then on the init, or init uh, we're going to take that code and we're going to set it to state. And we're going to call, we're going to send a message to ourselves to load that code. Uh, that's our handle info. We're load and it's going to receive the state. And it's going to do some stuff that we'll talk about in a second. Um, and then when calculate is called, we're going to actually call calculate on it. We're going to pass in the link that we want to do. And it's going to run the Fibonacci code and then it's going to give us back a number. It's going to return that result. There's that reply result, um, and then, of course, the mo our module, which is our code. Uh, after it's done, we have that process send after. Because, of course, if I, on a call, if I try to kill the process, remember, we don't want to keep these around. We want them to go away when they're done doing their calculation. If I try to call it beforehand, we're not actually going to get a chance to return our state back, and we're not going to actually finish that uh, synchronous call. So what I do is I say, well, just wait a second and then die off. Uh, is basically what I'm doing. I call the, I uh, send a message to exit, and then of course the process exits, it exits with normal status. There was no reason to to have an error; it just dies. Now, does anybody have any questions on that code? Is everybody following me? Everybody good? All right. Uh, here we go. Oh wow. Y'all can all see that, right? Here's our supervisor. For our supervisor, all we're actually doing is starting up the supervisor, and then we're adding on our init, we're actually adding the worker, which is going to be our, back, our background calculator. We pretty much saw this code before, so I won't spend too much time on it. <coughs> and then we're going to have our function called start calculator which is going to take code, and it's actually going to go ahead and start one of those child processes, and then we can go ahead and execute it. So, that is... Uh, I have no idea what to do with ah, this. Ah, shoot. All right, give me a second, because I forgot something here real quick. So... Um, See, this is what happens when you plan uh, talks and you try to do it, and of course, then you go live coding, and something always goes wrong, doesn't it? Uh, it's, let's see here. Uh, I had commented this out. Okay, well, so the problem with that is, is if I kill this, Victoria's gonna start all over, and who wants to see this talk again, right? Um, so let's do this. Let's do system suspend uh, background. All right, and then we'll. Uh, Let's see. Hot swapping code. Oh, it's funny I did that one. Um, so anyway, so what we just did, we had a running process that was running, that was up there and, and working. And one of our developers, I don't know who it was, commented out some code that we actually needed, didn't know how to handle it. Now, it didn't blow up because we had that catch-all because that message came in, it didn't know what to do with it, and it just said, hey, I don't know what to do with this. 
<coughs> but we could also put some code in there to where we said send a message, send an email, hey, something's not right, whatever we want to do. So what I actually ended up doing is I suspended the service for a second and recompiled the code. That's what that C is. That allows us to recompile that file. And then I resumed it so it's, it kind of unpaused the, the service, and then I could actually continue on without having to restart the process altogether. Now, there's another way to do hot swapping of code, which I tend to try to, like everybody loves the idea of hot swapping code. It's like a really cool thing to do. The problem with it is, is there's a very particular way you have to do it. So when you have a function, if you want to be able to hot swap code within, say, a process, you have to, um, you have to do an absolute name. So you have to call like module.function, and that's going to force it to reload the code because you can actually have two versions of the code running at the same time. You can have one old version and the new version that you just pushed out, but until you actually force it to, to reload the code, it's not going to reload the code. It's just going to keep going on. Now, if you push another version out, it's going to get rid of the oldest version. And so you can actually, it drops off the old version because you can only have two. As you can see, it can get a little complicated, and unless you really need to do it for some reason, I, I would try to avoid it. But this is a cool little thing that you can do. Did I fool you all at all? No? No, not really. Good? Really nice. Okay, cool. All right, let's see here. Code loading on a remote node. Now, Remember I kept telling you about this code loading stuff. So what we actually want to do is we want to read the code in from that module, and we want to pass it over to another node somewhere else. could be on some Google Cloud somewhere. Um, and execute that code and get a response back. So let's take a look at that real quick. So we'll start with our sequencer. Now, get code. So if you notice that this is a funny atom dot function, well, what we're actually doing is we're calling into Erlang code. Now, the, I guess the not so little secret is that underneath there are things in Elixir that still are basically Erlang calls, and a lot of it at some point is an, er, uh, an Erlang call. You just have to go down deeper than you used to four years ago. Four years ago, it was pretty easy. You'd open up a file, and there'd be a function, and boom, it would be calling into Erlang. <coughs> But now what we're going to do is we're actually going to utilize a beam and uh, or an OTP to say we're going to get this code. We're going to give it the module that we want to get. So it's going to basically read itself in, and it's going to create what we have over here. Uh, our module, the binary, which is the string value of the code, and then the file, which... The file you don't actually need, and I'm not sure if you've been a long time Erlanger, you might know. I mean, I'm sure there's a good reason so that you know, but I mean, uh, my thought is if you're passing it over to another node, it doesn't necessarily have access to that file. So really, once you load it into memory, it's in memory. Now, I would assume that you could persist it to a file if you really wanted to. Um, but the idea is that we're going to actually load this code up into memory. And so that is now the same code that we wrote on one node, we're going to send over to another node, and then that code is going to be executed from that node. And then it's going to report back to the other node, hey, I did a value for you. So let's see if this works. Uh, all right, let's do something. Wow, that only took 37 microseconds. Oh, did I not? Oh, I know why. I did not hot swap code on the session. Testing, testing. Is yes. this thing on? Okay, are we ready to do this? Uh, code loading on a remote node. Let's try it this time. Wow, that only took 873 microseconds. So, we just did about 100. Let's do. Wow, that only took 20 milliseconds. Oh, pretty fast. Wait, did I get enough numbers in there? I don't think. Okay, this will. Wow, well, that only took 1,793 right. milliseconds. So as you can see, we're now taking that code, we're sending it over, and I'll show you the code itself. The other thing that we can do, which is kind of fun, um, anybody can do it once, right? 
Let's do it ten times. Wow, that only took 1,746 milliseconds. Wow, that only took 3,202 milliseconds. Wow, that only took 5,152 yeah, on milliseconds. Wow, that only took 2,074 milliseconds. I'm going to stop her because she will keep talking. Wow, She's that as bad only as I am took 2,693 oh. oh, that's right. Why? Because wow, we have the code running on another node. And so I'd have to actually crash the other node. Wow, and that only took so I'll just turn her down for a minute. Wow, that only took She's just talking, 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 talking. She's worse than I am. Um, so anyway, we can see, we'll actually look at the code while she's talking about it. All right. Um. All right. So this is kind of how I was controlling the whole thing. I was doing gen server cast. Uh, I had the, my messenger on the other node. Um, the I would send the message over to the other node. I would send a start, restart, or whatever, pause. Um, my next is actually just a call to start. But our calculate sequence, basically we take a, a length, and then we have a default value of one. So if I don't pass in a count, it just does it one time. <coughs> now, we're iterating over a range here, and we're using task. Now, task and agent are two other types of basically wrappers around gen server. Tasks are meant for doing asynchronous things. You just want to fire something off and forget it. Agents are used more for storing, like if you wanted to have like a data store or something like that, like a temporary data store, um, and you want to put values in there. So tasks are really great if you want to do asynchronous calls. So basically, it's going to send out each one and just going to keep loop through, or looping through them until they're done. Um, and then, of course, you see our gen server cast because this isn't going to. This does not want to wait for a response. This just wants to send it over there. Our messenger on the other node will, when it's done, it'll send something back to us to report back in that it's done and give us those values. Um, and actually, let's see our mailbox. I like to ex expose a little bit of what was actually working. Here is basically how I ran the whole thing. Messages would come back from the back, or, um, from the background, and if a message came in that I needed Victoria to tell us, it would just call say on the command line uh, and spit out the message. Uh, when those examples were run, now all that, all those slides that you saw, basically I utilized what uh, Elixir already put in there for the um, for I/O ANSI or ANSI helpers, and so it basically grabs the doc, um, the module doc reads it in into binary and sends it over and kind of formats it for you so it looks all nice and pretty. You can use print header, print doc, and stuff like that. So this entire talk was written using Elixir. I did not use anything else, and I did not use any external libraries or anything like that. And um, when I first started thinking about doing this talk, I was going to include things like Ecto and Phoenix and things like that. But those are all things you can explore on your own. There's plenty of documentation on them. Most of you are probably familiar with MVC pattern. Uh, seeing that this is a .NET conference, most of you are probably familiar with Link, which Ecto is very similar to Link syntax. It's not hard to pick up. So let's see where we're at because... Um, oh. That's all I got, so you are on your own now. Oh, great. All right, so there we have it. Now, this was not your typical... Intro to Elixir, I know I kind of covered some stuff that you probably wouldn't get into in that first trimester, maybe not even the second trimester. Uh, but I hope that it was an interesting look. Um, I hope that there were some things that you kind of picked up on that kind of went beyond the, hey, look, here's, here's binding. Because you can figure that stuff out in 10 minutes. Why stand up here and take up your time talking about it? So I want to kind of show, focus on some of the, the cool features, not to mention my talk tomorrow I use a lot of this stuff in what Coyote does. So what Coyote basically does, and I'll just kind of give you a preview, is that it's, it's basically routing traffic between nodes. So when an application comes up, it registers with the leader server. Uh, the leader server can then pass messages over to it to have all that working. So I'm using code loading. I'm using uh, I'm node connecting. I'm watching the nodes when they go down. Um, if you notice, like when I dropped one of these nodes, when it came back up, she started over, she realized that something was going on, she tested the connection to make sure it was there, and then went on. 
<clears throat> so, but I'll get into more of that tomorrow. What I want to do, and I hope that I've, uh, that I've kind of helped with that, is spark a curiosity. When I first got involved in Elixir, the big thing was I was curious. And I think as developers, we're intrinsically curious. Like, we want to know a little bit more. We're not just happy with what we're doing today. We kind of want to see what else is out there. Now, I did .NET for a number of years. I was a C-sharp developer for 10 years. Prior to that, I did Perl, uh, PHP, um, and various other languages along the way. But I kind of came around. That curiosity kept me moving from language to language. And it wasn't even, there was languages I looked at that I didn't never, I would never use. Actually, when I first found Erlang living in Jacksonville, Florida, I realized that there was no way I was getting a job in Jacksonville, Florida using Erlang. And this was at a time before like a big remote, like, like the big remote push. So I got into Ruby and I, I did that for a while. But functional languages always kind of called to me. And I think that, like I said, developers as, on a whole are curious people. And so I want to show you something that's going to make you curious. If I stand up here and talk about the basics of Elixir and kind of the, what you can get on the, the, the getting started guides, it's not going to get you to go up and... So that's a good question. What kind of systems do... Uh, I'm repeating it just because of the mic. But what kind of systems is this we could fit for? Honestly, it's, uh, I think it's working its way to a pretty good uh, general purpose language. Like, you can do most things. You can, uh, you can write scripts and have them executed and things like that. Um, it's, you know, it's picking up a lot of steam because of Phoenix, uh, because of web development and things like that. But I treat Phoenix a little bit different than most people. Uh, I, I go by the idea that Phoenix is not my application. It's a key to my presentation layer. Uh, it allows me to put stuff on the web. So I build these small applications that I can then distribute uh, sometimes across multiple nodes, sometimes on the same one. I mean, there's not, you don't necessarily need to distribute everything, but like systems that I'm working on currently, we have large amounts of data that need to be processed. And so it is kind of handy to spin something up and push it over to another node. But it's also really fast on a single node uh, if you're building just a web application or if you're building, you know, the... the there's even, like, one of the things that I had looked at doing a few years ago was, I guess, with the Electron, the desktop applications, running a, an Elixir backend on a desktop application and using Electron. Um, I kind of uh, went down that path and then backed out of it. Uh, Rob Connery actually was the one that was trying to convince me to do it. And I was like, eh. It sounded fun, but I'm not a huge JavaScript um, fan. So um, and it's not that I don't – I shouldn't say I'm not a fan – it's just, it's one of those things I write bad JavaScript, so <laughs> I tend to try to avoid it, um, which is like everybody here, don't lie. Um, <clears throat> so I hope that answered your question. But I mean, it's pretty much, I mean, it's, it is actually a good fit for a lot of cases. I mean, it's, it's definitely working. And it's easy and fun to use. Um, I don't know uh, what languages you're using now, but I mean, it does have that kind of Ruby feel to it. Um, the, you know, it's funny as I hear a lot of people like in the Erlang community complain because of the Ruby syntax, um, you know, but it's, you know, it teaches, you know, if you want to use Erlang, use Erlang. That's fine. I'm not going <laughs> to. Yeah, pretty much. I use, uh, it's the language I use the most now. I haven't, um, I have been pretty much 100% Elixir for about two years. Um, some Ruby sprinkled in there, um, but it's been a while since I've really written any other. I mean, of course, you know, like the JavaScripts and stuff like that, and SQL and stuff. But um, for the most part, um, all right. I guess any other? Qu I mean, that's pretty much what I got. What you got? You have an example of the opposite: the system that you couldn't build in Elixir. Do I have an example of a system that I couldn't build in Elixir? No, you wouldn't. Yeah. Wouldn't? Yeah. Um, off the top of my head, no. I think I, I haven't run into a case where it wasn't necessarily a good fit. Um, and if I could remember back, because in the early days there were some things that I noticed that like there was other languages that were definitely faster at doing it. Um, but there there have been so many improvements to the language and the speed of the language in the last few years that it's kind of getting a little. The lines are getting blurred between what isn't a good fit and what isn't, or what is and what isn't. Um, I think the big concern right now is like how people are building 
um, because you do have that influx of people coming from object-oriented languages that kind of get caught up in building things a certain way. And this is one of the problems that I kind of solved for, for solved a few years ago is that you come to, um, come to the language and you start implementing old habits and you're basically just rewriting your old language. And, and I'm, a, I'm a firm believer of, you know, bring what you know into the new language so that you have that kind of to fall back on, but respect the paradigm of the language that you're working on and try to figure out how it wants you to do it. Um, because I think too many people try to force the old paradigms of their old languages on the new language, and then they're like, hey, this is broken, it doesn't work, this is not anywhere near as good. And it's like, you're not using it right. <laughs> you know, so I think that that kind of comes into play. Um, any other questions? Yeah. Uh, I'm actually going to just put the project on GitHub, and then I'll, uh, you can, I'm N U R U G G E R 07, new regger 07, um, on GitHub, and I will just push up this with a readme that kind of walks through how to set it up and how to walk through it. Uh, I think that's probably the best way to do it. Uh, and then that way you can look at the code, you can play with it, you can fork it and tear it up and, you know, criticize it, all, everything that you want. So. <laughs> I think so. Um, and actually, there's in the States, I know that there's a, a few groups that are starting up. One, um, there's, uh, if you're familiar with the Rails Bridge pro uh, project, there's like an Elixir Bridge project that's starting up to try to bring people in uh, to women into code. Um, but there's also, uh, I saw something about a program for kids, teaching kids Elixir from the start and functional languages from the start to, to try to get, you know, people on board with it and things like that. It, it actually, I mean, it is a really good language. It's easy to use. It's, uh, you can get up and running with it in five minutes and start working in it. You don't necessarily have to traverse the, the, the trials and tribulations of OTP right away. Uh, in fact, a friend of mine that got into Elixir a couple of years ago actually mentioned that um, you know, he spent a year using Elixir and never used OTP like processes and, and gen servers and things like that. Um, and then, of course, once he started getting into it, he you know, it's, it's to each his own. Like you're going to find the projects that you do. You can get into it. You can use it. You can get into pattern matching and binding and understanding immutability, and then work into the OTP stuff because it's deep. The OTP stuff is deep. So, anybody else? All right. Well, thank you. I hope you enjoyed it.